want to ruin America. So we have, we're in the middle of what, I, what, what I'll, I'll name a moral panic. And there are people, and there's, a, 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 I think it's Stanley Cohen. It's Cohen, something Cohen, I'm sure you can Google it quickly. Um, there's a moral entrepreneurship. People decide to take this up, take up the banner, and something must be done. And, and the problem is, is when you hear something must be done about hackers, that kind of sounds like this, right? And I don't like being like, wait a minute, something's got to be done about us. Uh-oh. I've, I've kind of heard that before. So the state gets involved, except the state does a couple weird things. The first one is responsabilization. They actually abdicate their role to protect regular people. Think of this way. If someone stole, if someone vandalized $10,000 worth of your property and you called up the police, would you expect some kind of response? Probably, something. I'll run over and do a report, or do, there'll be some kind of showing your face. If, a, if you've got $10,000 of the damage due to malware, imagine what happens if you call the police. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, have you heard about McAfee? If that, right? You know, I've, call, I've called law enforcement. Like, I've actually got someone in my systems or my client's systems, and they're causing damage. And it's like, if it's not interesting, like, uh, no, click. So it's really, the, the, the idea is that computer crime and, and, those, and those damages are really the citizen's fault. Go, go handle it yourself, not our problem. So they abdicate. And maybe they give you some ideas, like in, in the, the, the larger sort of enterprise sense, the recent cybersecurity framework where we're going to do something about cybersecurity on a national level. Oh, great. What are you going to do? We're going to generate a framework that references other frameworks, but we're going to color code them. Right? That's kind of my take on it. And like, wow, I, this looks like the Tinky Winky's Purse Homeland Security five layer, five color thing. Okay. Great. That's uh, really going to do a lot for cybersecurity. But also, because of this, we need more power. We need the right to be able to look at data held by, by large data brokers. We need more power to be able to face this threat. At the same time, we're recognizing that we're not actually doing much about it. Or at least, we're putting the responsibility back on you. But when we have to show that we can do stuff, we have to show force. We have to be, the state has to be a lot stronger. Now this is, this kind of rambling thing, I want to bring back to how it affects you as an individual. Most, of, most hackers, criminal hackers, and I realize this, you might not think you're a criminal, but that doesn't mean the state doesn't. Most will not get caught. The amount of stuff that could violate 18 U.S.C. 1030, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and the amount that actually gets prosecuted is, you know, a billion to one. So most people will not get caught unless you're not doing good OPSEC or if you're operating openly. Kind of a dangerous precedent. That means that people who consider themselves white hats and do things like, I publish what I found. I want to tell people about it. That's operating openly, right? You are standing out and saying, I did this. So all of a sudden, you're going to get the attention of the state. And they're going to determine whether or not you've done something that warrants prosecution. So if you are kind of caught up in the system, expect greater scrutiny. If they can portray you as a threat rather than a prankster, you're a threat, you're Ermigerd, you're dangerous. And it's like speeding in a rainstorm. It's harder to catch people doing it, because you know it's all dark and hard to find, but when they do, you expect a whooping. So when are we actually gonna talk about law? Okay, 18 U.S.C. 1030, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This bans unauthorized access or excess of authorized access or granted access to a protected computer. Protected computers, pretty much anything that isn't actually powered down in your basement. Because it's, if, it, if it affects interstate commerce or interstate communication, well, this, for as little as it works, um, is a protected computer because it's in interstate communication. You know, I sent, a, I sent an email to, this morning, went out of state, great. 
So, any, and obtaining information, as simple as that, I, without access, or without authorized access, obtained information. That's a CFAA violation, a felony. Vague as hell. The, and it's in deliberately vague. When this was written, there's a great, uh, great paper in this by Paul Ohm called The Myth of the Super User. And it's an actually relatively, um, for a law review article, it's relatively tangible and, and useful to non-lawyers. And it basically lies out that there's a deliberate point in making this big, broad, vague law, which was a belief that hackers, because they are supernatural creatures, can change their behavior to skirt around the law and because of this we should make these laws vague so we can make it kind of bump over and catch them. Well, normally when, when we describe behavior as, well, you're skirting around the law, it means that you're not violating the law, right? Like, do you know that you were driving 44 and a 45? That seems like you were trying to skirt the law. Like, no, I was obeying it. Do you know what you were doing? Not yet, but I think you're going to tell me. So, the, but this belief, and it was, it was just like looking through congressional testimony, that was the belief. Like, these people can read the law and they'll modify their behavior to not violate it. And by read, like, that's, that's what we call law abiding. But no, we need, so this, this very, very vague language is deliberate because there was belief that we would modify our behavior to skip ahead. Well, okay. So, going through. Obtaining information, causing damage, our furtherance of fraud are all, the, you need to have the unauthorized access and one of those three things, or one or more of those three things. Attempt to do so is also criminal. Asking someone else to do so is criminal. There's a case where a lawyer was actually charged under the 18 U.S.C. 1030 for issuing a too broad subpoena to gather information held in a database. And it was kind of a douchebag subpoena, but uh, at least, you know, me growing up in New Jersey, if being a douchebag was illegal, we'd be in trouble. I'll let that, uh, okay. So the problem is that there are, in a lot of other laws, there are loopholes or ex exceptions. And here's one where there isn't. There is no good reason or self-defense exclusion under the CFAA. Every year I go to some kind of like straight suit and like not this kind of suit con, and I talk to other lawyers in the space and someone brings up this old trope of, active self-defense, which is hack back. And it, it's great, especially if you're like Lockheed Martin, where you can sell a $14 million system that will, that has like a lot of macho terms, like kill chain enforcer, you know. And or so it's like, like either the bad metal band I tried to be in in high school or, or a Lockheed Martin product. And um, the problem is, is that there isn't a self-defense exclusion. So doing that, it's like, I know why you want to sell it, because it sounds awesome, because you're upper level management, and you go to your infosec people, and they're like, hey, our defenses are okay, but we still get hit. Like, why don't we strike back? Because I'm angry. And it's like, because you can't, because it's not lawful, and I don't want to go to prison. So those exclusions aren't there. Maybe it's a good thing they aren't, but the no good reason, no First Amendment change to that, no, no kind of, I, I was doing it, but none of that there. So criminal and civil penalties, fairly extensive. Like a basic CFAA violation, if you're not going out and really trying to screw things up, is still at least three to four years minimum in federal prison. And also many states have equivalent laws that you can also get charged under. So that's, that's the fear part of this talk. Additional pieces of law that modify this. EULA's in terms of service. These kind of lay out, when we we're talking about, you know, earlier, the unauthorized use or excess of authorized use, 
well, what sets your rights? What says you, what you are allowed to do and what you aren't allowed to do? Well, that's in a EULA or a term of service. Who here reads EULAs in terms of service? You're lying. Um, I, I, well, I remember once talking to a lawyer who wrote them, and I remember this because it was we got one, and it was like 27 pages, and I just crept through and said, I'm sorry, when did you guys get bought out by Google? Actually, it was when did you get bought out by Yahoo? And he's like, why? I'm like, because you used Yahoo's terms of service. It's like, you should have found and replaced all ep ep examples of Yahoo. And he's like, no one reads these. Like, you didn't. You, 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 didn't even, you didn't read it when you wrote it. How much did you bill your client for it? And then I'm thinking, this guy's got the best goddamn scam. Like, he billed them like $10,000 to copy and paste it. And it's like, no one's noticed that. And that's three years ago. Like, wow, that's, uh, I, I, that's a scam that's so awesome. I mean, on one hand, another hand, like, you're lazy, and I hate lazy, unless it's me. And then I'll justify it somehow. So other things that set about the, this vague, what permission have you been granted to do? Vulnerability assessment or pen test scope. And I, I, God, I hate writing them. God, I hate reading them. And I'm sure those of you who are hiring pen testers in that kind of, kind of space are also doing the, I hate doing this, but you really, if you're, if, you, if you're on the other side, you want to know exactly where you can go. And the, the good part of this is the permission granted can also be oral. So if you don't know, like you're, you're halfway through, three quarters through that pen test and you're poking at stuff, if you don't know, it is better to ask. Because that way if they go, yeah, sure, I'm like, okay, you said I could do this. So there's no question. And be very clear, especially if you do this in email, because the advantage of email is you've got a paper trail. So ask, say, like, can I do this? Yes, no. Third party audit clauses are ugly and everyone uses them. Because it's, I, you know, I as company A have to worry about company B's holding my data. Company B though is hosting their stuff at company C. So in order for me to know how my data is secured, I have to have that third party audit clause that allows me to audit C, even though I have no contract with C. But B has to bind C and therefore let me in. That's permission. However, you have to make sure it covers you as well. So you're allowed to ask and get that in writing in some form. It doesn't have to be you know, on paper with signatures and you know, subparagraph C. You just have to have some kind of cover for this. And the final bit of laws that affect you are NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. So let's walk through a hypothetical. White hat testing systems. And now this could be an authorized, paid, you know, you're working for some company that, you know, we do pen tests better than everyone else. Okay, great. Uh, you know, our pen testers are awesomer. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear that or make that pitch at DEF CON in a, in a week or two. Um, you're testing systems, and you're testing, say, third-party systems. What if I'm testing... I, you know, I'm, I'm doing vendor management, so I have to audit B. I'm company A, company B. Company B, though, is hosting a lot of their stuff on a third company. Maybe it's a collocation provider that, that also offers hosted service. Maybe it's Amazon. Maybe it's somebody. And you have to go and say, I have to test your systems, but I don't really know where your systems end and Amazon start. So it's helpful to kind of get that whole path security, know where, or get that whole path understood and say, I can go up to here, but no further. Making sure you have clear permission keeps you on the protected side. Now, let's make this one step further. What if you are, we'll just say, the freelance white hat, as in you aren't doing this to protect your employer, you're doing this out of straight up curiosity or some kind of consumer protection. You're Ralph Nader-esque. You, you think you found a vulnerability in some common, well-supported, uh, well-used platform, and you want to take a poke at it. Now, if you own it, you know, it's a device that you own, and they're in that 32-page EULA, 
there isn't something about what you can and can't do. Because more and more, the EULA says what you don't own. You know, I, I theoretically own my laptop because, you know, I own, you know, I, it's open source, blah, 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 blah. Somehow there's a GPL that provides what I can do to it. I don't think I own my phone because it's interfacing at all times with Verizon and how far I can go depends on what Verizon lets me do with it. So I might not be able to test everything my phone does because it goes back and it actually touches stuff that Verizon owns. So I might not have authorization to test that and uh, authorization to break that. So that's something I kind of want to get out there is to say, it doesn't matter that you have good intentions if your license doesn't grant you that power. And I'll kind of walk through that in a bit. Um, second hypo, hacktivist, doing web defacement or DDoS. We've all known someone who did that. You're still liable for the damages, even though you're saying, I'm not doing this for profit or malice, I'm doing this to further a cause. I'm doing this as speech. And I don't really like the argument that DDoS is free speech. I'm sorry, maybe I'm old and boring, but it seems to reduce speech. And the idea, if you go back to Brandeis's you know, marketplace of ideas is, Mar speech is better, even if it's stupid, even if it's evil. So. DDoS, but anyway, you're still liable for those damages even though you're not doing it for malice. There's no free speech exception to 18 U.S.C. 1030. Yeah. It's a free, I'm sorry, a free pen test to the pen, uh, did, did, As a community, um, did, did the Hotel Pennsylvania grant you permission to do so? Probably not. So your authorization has not been granted. There is no, yeah, and, and the additional stuff is, is fun to think about and is not a defense. Like when I've done the criminal defense, like, but they did this, not relevant, sorry. So third hypo, the mere criminal. The person who just does something, except they do it on a computer to somebody else's computer, there are sentence enhancements, extensive sentence enhancements for using, for, for computer crime that are sort of built into the system. Every computer crime uh, uh, incident I've seen that's been sentenced under the federal guidelines, there are automatic sentence enhancements, just because sophisticated means. I, uh, one case in Texas, Guy installs log me in on a system, and they go, oh, so that's that's you know that's a sophisticated means, two levels in a sentencing enhancement. Like, it's log me in. Like that's that's not leap, but to a court, to a prosecutor, like yeah, that's I didn't know how to do that. Like, okay, so your VCR is still blinking twelve. Anything more? Any anything better than that? You know, sophisticated means. Wow. That's interesting, and it's automatic. It's almost automatic. I haven't seen I haven't seen a prosecution that didn't have that. Clearly, anything above that is just like you know we're enhance we're we're enhancing your sentence, and I love that newspeak, right? Like we're going to make your sentence better. How by making it longer? So what to avoid? And I want to make this more practical now. Either own the box before you own the box or get clear, clear permission, because that's gonna be your defense. You exceeded authorization. No, here's my authorization. You exceeded the scope of that authorization. Well, here's how I understood it, and here's how you're now claiming it meant. Well, at least I've got enough cover that I can argue. I got some space there to wiggle. And most prosecutors, the, the reason why most prosecutors have like 90 to 98% win rates is that they don't take losers. So they will, if there's something that you can go like, wait a minute, you got a decent argument there? Uh, can you make this go away? Are not prosecuted, are 
offer some like really stupid plea deal like we want 900 we want to put this defendant away for 900 years what's the plea 30 days you wanted that to go away you wanted you want something and you won't take it to trial so it will get dropped but they're not they're not even charging people unless they've got really good evidence and that's why I want to start talking about evidence now be careful about disclosure I'm not saying don't disclose I'm saying be careful about it most of the prosecutions I've read are for people who got trouble and not for what they did what they did didn't get anyone's attention it's the talking about it that got them there and if you can make hackers not gossip I don't you know not possible good operational security does not stop after the act okay what to avoid more on operational security consider who knows what you've done consider what evidence your whole track has created where that evidence is right you've got a log on your system there's a log on the remote system you've got perhaps if there's network monitoring between you and them what does that say how does that map back to you now the bigger thing is consider what statements you've made either pseudo anonymously or in real life what maps back to you what what's been said that can be used against you and this is one of those things that I try to drill into people us when I because I see how the outside world views us in some ways and imagine everything you said said and interpreted in the worst possible light what did they mean by that it must mean they hate America and Think of, there's a, the Cardinal Richelieu line about, you know, give me six lines by the most honest man and I will find there's something to condemn him. Except we say damnable things all the goddamn time. We say things that can easily be misinterpreted. And we interpret them the, in a, you know, in a jovial, fun way. And they don't. So, on statements. Statements will be used against you. There's this rule about hearsay. Any out-of-court statement made for the point of proving it is not admissible unless there's an exception. There are like 15 exceptions, and I won't rattle through all of them because the one that's going to bite us is statements against interest are admissions of guilt. And everything you do is a statement against interest or an admission of guilt in these cases. An example, fuck shit up. I have read that, I have read this line in more indictments, in more sentencing guidelines, in more sentencing briefs, and I think I say that at least 20 times a day, right? Oh man, you can get in there and you just like, fuck shit up, blah. Yeah, because you're, you're like, you know, like, you're doing that, as a, part of my job as a vulnerability assessor is, I have to threat bait, you know? If you own this box, what could happen? You know, like total fucking ownage, but you have to then make it to like a business proposition, right? It's like, this means that all your clients will hate you forever. They will burn you in effigy. Oh, okay, that would, that would suck, because you know, I kind of want to have clients or business or whatever. So you, you, we use that term. However, that, that gets misinterpreted, or actually gets interpreted in that negative, ugly way. Like, think of a prosecutor as the person you've been on a four-day road trip in in a hot car with no air conditioning, and someone spilled a Coke on the seat, so it's all sticky. Like, so anything, they, anything you say is going to get interpreted by someone who just wants you to die. You know, you know, you know you get that, like, you, 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 you're thinking things, you're saying things like, you breathe like Hitler. Right? I want you to contemplate everything you said interpreted by someone who hates you at that level. So fuck shit up means I want to ruin this machine and everyone connected to it and cause death and destruction. Because that's how it's interpreted. The, the uh, uh, Jesse McGraw case in Texas like found a, HV, a weak HVAC box you know, that was controlling it and said, oh, you could really fuck shit up there. That went into the sentencing enhancement. That earned him an extra 18 months.
by just saying that. And it was, you could fuck shit up. That gets interpreted as, he wanted to kill people. Admissions like this, seeing this in an IRC log, here's the usernames and passwords to log into this box. Okay, that statement right there shows intent and shows the understanding of the crime and also kind of admits to the crime. Boop, that line. And this is my favorite, like you're not a cop, are you? That, that goes back to other computer crimes that I've helped uh, defend. Sorry, I want to make sure. Make, want to make sure that I've parsed this in the most negative light. Um, that line comes up, and it's, it shows that you knew you were doing something that you shouldn't have. So it shows intent to commit a crime, instead of just it's some part of a negotiation to a later negotiation. And I'll just leave it at that. You know, you can you can imagine where this statement comes up most often in an IRC chat log with a supposed 14-year-old girl. Interpret in the worst possible way. These are criminal prosecutions I have, I have, I have you know, helped defend. Not that I'm ever on an IRC log. Um, you know, talking to supposed 14-year-old girls. Okay. Finally, I want to point out about the not making things better. There's a, a, a criminal defense attorney, attorney I've worked with in the past has this great line, which is, once the bracelets come on, shut up. You are not talking your way out of handcuffs. And it's true. At that point, all you can do is make things worse. And usually we do. Because that's a traumatic experience, especially for us. Because we're not used to, like the only time you have handcuffs put around you is you're down at the tool lockpick village going, I think I can do this, right? It's, it's fun. Because oftentimes they've got like some kind of nice, cute uh, uh, layer around them so that way, you know, you know whose handcuffs there are. Not, you know, the Smith and Wessons being, you know, whacked on you by a burly cop who doesn't want to, you know, really hear any shit out of you. So we tend to panic and we tend to try to figure like, what can I do to get out of this? And they exploit that fact. And uh, a, a friend of mine who works for the FBI has pointed out that They'll deliberately try to, to rattle people once arrested because then they'll try to talk. They'll want to spill things. They want to, and it's the worst time ever to talk when you're scared. So consider ma when making statements that are recorded. This goes back to the good OPSEC rule. On IRC, you're being logged. Anyone else in that chat may be logging it. You know, your chat client may be logging it. That's leaving evidence behind that's going to get interpreted. So consider what you're saying. And yes, the whole bit about surveillance causes self-censorship. Yes, 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 it does. Accept that. Forums, Facebooks, Reddit, uh, all those statements. After an arrest, prosecutors are going to go through everything you've done, anything you've said, and that's coming back at you. So that, 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 that annoying little argument you got in because someone was wrong on Reddit is coming back at you. And I really don't ever be prosecuted for, you know, for the stupid arguments I've gotten in on Reddit. So, but those are going to come in. And the idea like, oh, why are they, why are they doing this? That's intrusive. Like, Yes, but they're looking for every statement you've made and they're looking f to use that to, to enhance their case as the prosecution. They're looking to find intent of malice. You aren't just a, 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 an amusing little prankster, you're an evil bastard coming to take America away. And they're looking for that. So all those dumb statements, you know, that dumb joke you cracked, imagine that in its worst interpretation. Jail conversations. The amount of, amount of when I worked as a public, with the public defenders, um, the amount of people who did not remember five minutes into a phone conversation that, the, that it was recording. And it's not just the recording, you know, yeah, yeah, whole NSA were recording everything. No, there's recording and then there's recording that we're actively going to, to listen to to find stuff that you've admitted to. 
So if you're arrested or you're in jail pending prosecution, do not say things like, I want you to dox the prosecutor. I want you to dox the judge. This is coming in against you. Sentence enhancement. Good job. You've, you've just turned a four-year sentence into an eight-year sentence. So this is the, you can't make things better, but you can, you can always make them worse. You can always turn a, a bad situation into an ugly situation. Also, consider when there's an informant. And I'm thinking of uh, a manual's observation a couple hopes ago that one in five is an informant. And that still scares me because I, I see more than five people in the room. <laughs> and I don't know if this is true, but it seems to be because every prosecution I've seen, there's a lot of information about very, very nitty gritty things that aren't in all those other evidentiary forms I've talked about. Like it's not a log on a PC. It's not a server log somewhere. It's not an IRC log. There's like intimate knowledge about what happened. And this is kind of the nature of breaking up any form of organized crime. You get one person, you get your hooks into them, and you get them to, to inform on everybody else, and maybe even you egg them on. You know, the, the Cebu's case, like clearly he was not merely an, a passive informant, he was an active one. So contemplate that. Contemplate that the person egging you on might have another interest. So, takeaways. If you can, beforehand, consider the legality of what you're about to do. Just like a, you know, a basic, and maybe this sounds a little too namby-pamby, but it's, a, it, it's something you should think about. And the evidence you're leaving behind, who will know about it? And that's like pre-incident planning. Post-incident planning is, if you get legal attention, you get the, 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 the business card of an agent on your door. At this point, you're now in the, I can't make things better, but I can make them a lot worse. So, and I hate sounding like, you know, the, the, the bar association with the shut up and lawyer up, but the, the amount of people who have, who have turned a matter of interest into being a defendant at this stage is too high. Yeah, I've watched smarter people than me fall into the trap. I've watched people say, like my favorite line is, they said I sent malicious code. I just did a SQL injection. Now for me, that makes me itch because that's an admission of a 1030 crime. Right there, boom, yes. And my FBI friend has pointed out that they will send the biggest, dumbest looking agent to talk to a suspected hacker. And this is someone who's, as he says, I have to get him new band-aids every week because the old ones fall off because they're just dragging, his knuckles are dragging behind him. And the guy is actually fairly competent. He's like, the, 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 as he says, the agent has you know, uh, extensive training, might not have a couple of degrees in computer science, but is not a dumb guy. Like, made a Roomba lawnmower. Okay, so, so clearly like someone who's on our wavelength, like I don't have a lawn, but I would love to have a lawn, you know, I would love to have like whirling blades of death that are autonomous. <laughs> so, and they send him in and he does the best dumb act possible. I don't know shit about computers, man. So what, what happened here? And there's an innate reaction among us because who doesn't like an ego stroke? So there's a temptation to explain things. This is dumb when the explanation, when, you know, think of it this way, we've all done help desk. Even if it's not been our job description, we've all helped people, we've all explained to people. And there are times when you do explain things to people and it's good for you. There are times you explain things to people and you talk about what you did and what you're doing is you're going from person of interest to Will the defendant please rise? That's something to be worried about. So at that point, you're like, I need to have someone parse everything I'm going to say just to make sure I do not walk myself into the trap. 
Okay, questions? Ask them now or ask them later. There's, oh, no mic? I'm not messing with the AV system, so bellow. Uh, I was receiving, oh, there we go. Uh, I was seeing some numbers like recently where it was, uh, on average, computer crimes were 15 years, but rapists were getting five, and just the absurdity of that situation. Um, why, why are there more enhancements for the computer crimes than actual like physical harm? Actually, the observation I want to make, the the because the whole like rapists get less time than hackers. No, I'm not saying anything about legitimate rape. No, that's a stupid thing to say. The, the observation, I, under the federal sentencing guidelines, you get more of an enhancement for causing damage to a bank than you do putting people at risk of death. I, I had the notes, and unfortunately they're in, I, I, don't, I didn't actually print, I didn't actually like write them down. They're sitting on my desk at home. But there is a belief that we are more dangerous than regular criminals. So it's not what you did, it's what you could have done. That comes into a sentencing in hand. That comes into a sentencing memo. And think of all the tools, those evil hacker tools you have. Like weird operating systems. Right? And I remember well I remember this was, you know, one like they had Nmap and I'm like looking at my I'm looking at my laptop like I'm really and Metasploit, like, oh, okay. Um, and they had other operating systems, like, and I'm, I'm actually saying this to a, a, a U.S. attorney and just shooting the shit, it's like, I have an OS2 VM on my, on my laptop. <laughs> Why? Once, because I, I actually was using it for a test, and another time just to mess with somebody, like the help desk came up and I, I put that in full screen, and I'm watching the help desk guy going, what the hell am I looking at? Like, you know, are the, the great line I have about, um, you know, I, getting, trying to get tech support on Intuit, and it's like, what are you, you know, well, what operating system are you using? Like, Windows 7, because it's in a, you know, VM. It's like, no, exactly, like, uh, it's a Windows 7 Service Pack 0 running in uh, open box on a Ubuntu 12.04 system. And he's like, I'll put you into Mac support. <laughs> yeah, but, but... Uh, all that sophisticated knowledge gets interpreted in really ugly, weird ways. He had many, many malicious tools. And I remember like one was like, he had Nmap. Like, Nmap is malicious? I, I, I can come up with a lot more malicious tools. And then I was like, I shouldn't say that. Because it's, it, the, like the, um, um, to, to kind of map this back into something more sane is, I remember uh, um, doing a grand jury and as a citizen, as a, you know, not as a lawyer, but just as a citizen, and they said, well, what evidence did they have that they were dealing drugs? And it was an O-house, three-beam scale, and three books on chemistry. I'm like, I have that in my house. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I need to accurately measure, ha uh, accurately measure uh, uh, brewing sugar. Really? I'm like, I'm not dealing drugs. And of course, it's really hard to, you know, my voice goes up, I'm like, I'm not dealing, like, God damn it. Now I'm a person of interest. God damn it. You know, but think of all the tools, because we love tools. And it's like, this is an incredibly dangerous tool. Like, that makes it better. Okay. So the, the takeaway is if you want to get revenge on someone uh, with a computer, you should beat them to death with it rather than using it electronically. Gotcha. <laughs> I think that's I think that's Lenovo's next ThinkPad commercial. <laughs> yeah, this this is a silly uh, sort of a silly question. Um, if you go back to the ugly days of the '90s, where uh, things like strong encryption were considered armaments, um, has anyone ever tried using a Second Amendment defense for a computer crime? Uh, kinda the self-defense argument I talked about earlier. Um, the problem is, is that the CFAA is, is broadly written with very few protections. So common law defenses, the, it's self-defense. I've heard it argued, there are like four law review articles, and no one successfully raised it yet. So I, I might try to raise the Second Amendment one, but that's what we call desperate. 
I ne there's a, there's a, a line I have, and why mine I try to do more nuts and bolts stuff is appellate cases. This is a case that gone to trial, didn't come out the way someone liked it, and then appealed, and that makes our law. And that's your name versus the United States, or your name versus the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or whatever. The problem is, is that, yes, you're, you're historical, because you've made the law and you've changed it, but it meant that you spent way too much time hanging out with dickheads like me for way, you know, like, talking about fine points of law that affect your life. I would like you to not have to make a pellet, you know, make a pellet history, and, like, let you steer clear of that. So, while it's an interesting argument to bring up the Second Amendment, that's both desperate and it means that you've been charged and all the good arguments didn't happen because there's such damning evidence against you. It's like, I'm, I'm winging with this, you know, and, the, and the, 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 you'll get the curse from the judge, which is, counsel, you make an interesting argument. And we're good at giving really backhanded compliments like my learned colleague, which means idiot. <laughs> so. That's an interesting argument. It means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you brief that, and I'm going to make you write 40 pages about how much of an asshole you are. <laughs> and I'll raise that, because that's like desperate. I'll try to make something. But it means that I'm it's like, dude, that's all I got. It's a loser. Yeah. Can you comment on the Supreme Court's responses to anything tech? My understanding is they're kind of idiots. <sighs> um, Realize that judges have to have to be generalists. Uh, a judge has to rule, you know, like the Supreme Court has to rule on patent cases about technology they don't get. They also have to understand, you know, they also have to rule on, 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 you know, most judges have to rule on things they don't fully understand. And the point of the, the, the advocates on both sides is to educate them well enough that they can. There's like this idea, like the way you go to senior management and talk about what you do. If you ever, if you're in a corporation, you have senior management that is, you know, generalists, and they're supposedly hyper bright people that can only, they can only consume PowerPoint. Um, and I've learned this. Like you've done a 22 point, 22 slide deck that explains this. Boil it down into three bullet points. Like. Uh, it would suck to be sued because that'd be all expensive. Is that the level of detail you're looking for? Well, make it better. I, uh, it's, an, it's an art form, but I'm not gonna say they're dumb. I'm gonna say that they're generalists who don't get it th at the level we do. Our, our, our knowledge is narrow and deep. Theirs is broad. Cool. Thanks much. I have cards if you need them.
Good morning. How many here are just to get a good seat for, uh, for the keynote? They're all, the same people are just still here all morning, camping out. 
I think there were people who were sleeping last night in this room. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, again, we will be streaming, folks who didn't hear in the last talk, we will be streaming the keynote uh, next door in the big room uh, on the sixth floor on the mezzanine, you know, the big 40,000 square foot floor on two screens, and downstairs at the bottom of the escalators where the concert was last night. So um, this will be a serious crowd control uh, situation for safety reasons. We really need to get people distributed in all these rooms uh, come keynote time. But I want to detract from this talk. We all know who the EFF is. We all love them. Four of, four of them are here. The well, fifth one is uh, en route by a cab right now and will be here momentarily. But uh, a lot has happened uh, in our community over the past couple years since the most recent hope, hope number nine, which it's, it's almost mind-boggling to think back just what all has happened in the past couple of years that EFF has been involved with, we've all been following. So uh, you've all read the description of this talk, but basically we've got a group here of, of some of the finest lawyers, activists, technologists, and uh, policy anal an analysts from the EFF. And this is going to be not just a uh, talk. This is going to be largely Q&A. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and you will all have an opportunity to ask the EFF about things that are on your mind. Thank you. Uh, 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 good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'll say, I assume that most of you are familiar with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but for uh, that one person who's not, uh, I'll give a brief uh, introduction of what we are. We are a nonprofit civil liberties organization that's dedicated to defending your rights online. We fight for privacy, we fight for fair use, we fight for freedom online to allow people to express themselves uh, and make the world a, a better place, a future that you want to live in. And we have, uh, we've had an interesting uh, year uh, over the last uh, 12 months, a lot of that having to do with the national security space. You'll probably be seeing a lot about that uh, over the course of this conference. Um, so we're going to go and uh, each of us will give a, a few minutes uh, description of what uh, we've been up to uh, over the last year, uh, talking about some of the EFF projects briefly, but then we'll get into your questions pretty quickly so we can have it basically this talk directed by you to your interests. Um, and so let me, let me start out. Uh, I am uh, Kurt Opsahl. I am an attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, so I work on several of our uh, uh, cases, um, uh, our NSA cases. We now have actually, uh, as of um, uh, earlier uh, this week, we have three cases that we're working on against the National Security uh, Surveillance Program. Uh, first one was, uh, uh, Jewel, or is Jewel, uh, Jewel versus NSA. Uh, that was filed in 2008 uh, based on uh, information that came out at that time, including information from a whistleblower, Mark Klein, about AT&T's cooperation and collaboration with the NSA surveillance program. Uh, and that suit has been going on for, for quite some time. It went uh, up to the appeals court, back down to the district court, where it is right now. Uh, last summer, after uh, uh, some of the new uh, uh, information and uh, additional details were being released uh, through uh, uh, Edward Snowden's leaks, uh, we had an, another f lawsuit filed, uh, first Unitarian versus U U uh, NSA. Uh, this is uh, a case that is focused on the right of association, the right of you as a part of an organization to not have the membership of that organization who you're associating with known by the government, preserve your anonymity in that. So a group of 20 uh, organizations from all across uh, political spectrums joined together with, uh, to sue the NSA to protect their right of association from the phone records program, because the phone record program was able to look at all of their calls, and from that you could derive who's a member of the organization and who, how often they're chatting with each other. Uh, and then just earlier this week, uh, we announced that together with the uh, ACLU, we were going to be helping with a, uh, another case, uh, Smith v. Obama. This was a case that was uh, filed and uh, uh, actually had gone through the, the district court. Unfortunately, uh, the district court uh, said uh, that, well, dismissed the case saying that uh, the program uh, 215 phone records program was okay, and now that is being appealed, so we came in with the ACLU to help on that appeal and try and get the appellate court to realize that it is unconstitutional, that it is illegal. 
Uh, in addition to uh, the NSA cases, I've been working on a case uh, for national security letters. These are letters that the FBI can issue without a judge, without a warrant, uh, without really much process at all, issue them to a service provider to find out information about the customers, and the service provider is not allowed to say that they even have received one. Uh, so we got a court to de declare them unconstitutional uh, back in March uh, of last year. And, oh, wait, wait. The government has appealed that, as you might expect, so we are defending that appeal. We just finished the briefing uh, and we're expecting to go to uh, oral argument probably in five or six months. Uh, things move at a very stately pace uh, in the appellate process. <laughs> Uh, so that's just a, a small sampling of some of the litigation work that we've been doing. Uh, but now let me see like, my colleague, Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Eckersley. Uh, I lead EFF's team of technologists who are uh, both advisors to the organization in terms of making sure that it understands how the internet works, how, how technology works, all of the theoretical computer scientific underpinnings of the policy work that we do so that we know which battles are the most important ones to fight. Uh, and we also build uh, actual products and systems that we put out into the world. Um, so good things to ask me about. You could um, talk about some of those projects. There's uh, our efforts to encrypt the web, both by persuading companies to offer uh, HTTPS when they didn't beforehand uh, through offering client upgrade support via HTTPS everywhere. Uh, for Firefox, Chrome, and other browsers. Um, our efforts to make sure that once the web is actually encrypted, it's genuinely secure. We've had projects like uh, uh, the SSL Observatory uh, to find weak points in that TLS encryption infrastructure and, and get them fixed. Uh, we have projects to try and up, we have a new project that's just starting called T uh, Start TLS Everywhere that tries to offer the same kind of uh, authentication options for email server to email server encryption that have been lacking until now. Uh, so that's one large effort we have. You know, the, 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 the slogan version of it uh, starting in about 2009 was, uh, let's try to encrypt the entire web in about five years. Uh, we're probably not going to do it in five. It'll, it might take seven or eight, but we, we are actually making a huge amount of progress there. Um, other good projects to talk about include the uh, open wireless um, uh, router project that we launched here at uh, Hope. Uh, and another thing that I'm going to be talking about at length on Sunday at 6 p.m. Uh, is Privacy Badger, which is a browser extension that figures out which third parties on the web are tracking you without your consent and then automatically blocks them, whether they're visible advertisers or invisible JS or widgets. Um, and then on the policy side, you can, uh, it's great to ask questions about the way that, uh, that that the technical perspective informs what EFF does. Uh, and a good examples of that over the years include our role in the fight against SOPA and PIPA, the internet blacklist bills a few years ago, where the ability to show up and make technical arguments seemed to actually make a, a big difference to that policy fight. Uh, the current fights around network neutrality are very interesting. Um, and uh, you know, that's actually been something that you know, years ago we, we fought with Comcast around reset injection into BitTorrent traffic. Now again, we're seeing more subtle discrimination by ISPs, usually around peering contracts and, and other subtle things. Uh, so all of that is uh, the stuff that I work on day to day. Hi, my name is Eva Galperin, and I'm a global policy analyst for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I work on EFF's international team which means that I spend all of my time worrying about all the places that are not the United States. So I have a lot to worry about. Um, over the last year, I have really spent a lot of time focusing on vulnerable populations, both inside and outside the US, and that's usually uh, journalists, dissidents, and activists. Uh, my work has primarily been focused in the post-Soviet states. I've done some work in Vietnam. I did a bunch of work uh, with Ethiop Ethiopian dissidents uh, this year. Uh, later, uh, you can ask Nate about that time that we sued the government of Ethiopia, which is an ongoing case. I spend a lot of my time working on the privacy and security advice that EFF gives 
to these vulnerable populations. So I've spent time working on revamping EFF's long, out-of-date uh, surveillance self-defense guide. I have just helped launch uh, the digital first aid kit along with a, a bunch of other NGOs, which I hope will be useful for, for people who have um, sort of uh, digital emergencies but are not really sure exactly what is going on or how they can be asking. Um, if you have questions about uh, surveillance, not just in the United States, but surveillance of non-U.S. persons, surveillance by countries other than the U.S., I am the person to ask. Uh, if you have questions about, you know, bone development or exploits or uh, surveillance software, I'm also the person to talk to about that. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, cool. Hey everyone, I'm Adi Kamdar. I'm uh, on the activism team at EFF. Uh, the activism team, what, what does that mean? Um, we, uh, everybody at EFF is an activist, but our team is focused on creating the campaigns, doing a lot of the, the public facing, take action uh, side of, uh, of what we do. If ever you have uh, called your congressman or, or, or signed a petition or done something like that, joined a, a, a march, something that we've, we've organized, um, that is my team. Um, recently, over the last year, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a crazy one, um, but uh, uh, a lot of what I've been focusing on, uh, apart from uh, the campaigns that we've been working on, is um, uh, patent reform. Uh, that's an issue that... Uh, <laughs> Oh man, um, we could talk about that. Uh, a lot of what we've been doing over the last year has been um, pushing back against patent trolls and trying to uh, actually pass patent reform. Uh, this is something that um, when a lot seemed stalled and broken uh, in Congress, and a lot is stalled and broken in Congress, um, this was kind of a, a glimmering beacon of hope as it was flying through and then it got killed, uh, murdered. So uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about that and how to move forward from there. Um, other things that I work on are things like open access to research, which is um, a very uh, important issue for us and something we've picked up uh, in the last uh, year, year and a half, um, uh, especially since uh, our friend uh, Aaron Schwartz's death. This was something he was passionate about. Um, and uh, I do a lot of work on consumer privacy and on state-level legislation. Hey, my name is Nate Cardozo. I'm a staff attorney uh, at EFF, as you might imagine, since I'm sitting up here on the Ask EFF panel. Uh, I do uh, free speech and privacy, generally, um, uh, working with Kurt a lot. Uh, some of the things that I do uh, is I participate in some of EFF's FOIA litigation. Um, for instance, we just sued uh, the NSA and the DOJ uh, for access to their so-called vulnerabilities equities process. This is the balancing test that uh, NSA uses to decide whether to report a vulnerability or sit on it. Um, as Eva mentioned, I uh, am the lead attorney in the case where we are suing the government of Ethiopia uh, for wiretapping our client, an American citizen who uh, goes by a pseudonym, Mr. Kadane. Uh, at his home in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, and shipping all of his Skype calls back to a command and control server in Ethiopia. Um, I also work on EFF's Who Has Your Back project. Uh, this is a project where EFF awards gold stars um, to the nice little companies that treat user data well when the government comes knocking. Uh, we we award good practices for things like posting law enforcement guidelines, transparency report, always demanding a content for data, and fighting for your rights in the courts and Congress. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I do. Uh, and then one thing that Kurt didn't mention that the two of us work on together uh, is we work on EFF's Coder's Rights Project. And this is the project uh, that if you are a security researcher, uh, a developer, an academic who wants to do security research or has done security research or wants to present about their research at a conference uh, or publish a paper on it, and you have legal questions about what you've done or what you want to do or what you're about to do or what you're about to talk about on stage in front of a whole bunch of feds, uh, and you want legal advice, um, please email us before you do that. Uh, info at EFF.org is a great way to get in touch with us. You. You're welcome. Um, so that's about it. Cool. All right, well, so now we'll turn to your questions. Uh, 
As we said, uh, as, as Nate was saying, we do do uh, advise a lot of people about uh, issues that they may have, but this is not the forum for that. You want to have a privileged conversation with us if you're looking for legal advice, and uh, going up to a microphone in front of a crowd of people is not a privileged uh, situation. Uh, so what we're about to say is, you know, about EFF, but it will not be legal advice. If you need legal advice, come talk to us elsewhere. Uh, and we will try and uh, uh, see what we can do uh, in a more private uh, circumstance. So I believe that there is a microphone in the middle here. It's, yeah, in, the, in this middle row here. So if anybody has a question, uh, we, can, we can begin. Hi, I have a question about FOIA. Now you mentioned that the EFF is currently uh, involved in several FOIA suits. I filed FOIA requests myself. I filed a couple of appeals. Um, could you just outline the process by which you know how something goes from just a FOIA request into an actual you know a lawsuit against a uh, a federal agency? Sure. Um, so question is, is about FOIA. FOIA is a federal law, so as, as the question assumes, uh, you can only file a FOIA request for a federal agency. Every state has an equivalent. Um, California is the Public Records Act. A lot of states, it's, a, it's called FOIA. Sometimes it's a sunshine bill. Um, but what you do is you write a letter, generally. Uh, can be very informal, saying, this is my FOIA request. Here's what I want. Uh, in the federal system, they have 20 working days to respond. Uh, if they don't respond within 20 working days, you can just plain sue. Um, and sometimes that's what we do, and that's what we did in the vulnerabilities, equities process FOIA um, that I mentioned. We didn't wait for their response because they blew their statutory deadline, so we just plain sued. Um, sometimes they do give you a response uh, which says we're working on it, uh, and therefore you have the right to sue then and there. Um, sometimes they give you a response saying go fly a kite, we're not giving you anything. Um, there are nine exemptions to the FOIA, uh, which I We'll be happy to get into, but this is probably not the context. Um, and they say that the documents that you wanted are exempt. Um, and at that point, you can appeal. Uh, the appeal is just another letter that you write saying, hey, you guys, you're wrong. They're not exempt for these reasons. Uh, and then sometimes they actually turn around and say, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, here it is. Um, but usually they say, no, go fly a kite, and then you can sue. Um, so that's, I, that, that's pretty much the way you do it. You just. Uh, we, we're lawyers, so we know how to write a complaint. It's not that hard uh, to, to sue in federal court. Um, I would recommend if you want to do it, uh, talk to a lawyer, get a lawyer, or if you want to do it by yourself, just go to EFF.org and look at some of our FOIA complaints uh, and crib from them. They're, they're yours for the cribbing. Uh, hi, I just wanted to get a general feeling from you all about um how safe it is to be doing DDoS uh, uh, using the computer, using the internet for free speech to protest uh, different companies. Just a, kind of a general feeling. I'm sure you've been involved in many, many uh, litigations, but uh, is it getting safer or more dangerous? It's. I've, I'm not really sure that I that I understand your question, but I'm going to start by answering it in in the way that. Uh, that we traditionally answer questions at EFF, which is that it depends, <laughs> and it's complicated. But I would start by saying that uh, your, your free speech rights online are, uh, are definitely under threat, no matter where you are on the planet right now, no matter whose jurisdiction you are in. Uh, in some places, uh, your, your free speech rights are more under threat than others. If, for example, you would like to uh, come out and, uh, and write something online uh, opposing the Chinese government while located in Beijing, this is not going to work out well for you. Uh, if, on the other hand, you are in, uh, you are in the United States, you are, uh, you are protected by the First Amendment. Uh, but there are also a number of ways in which the First Amendment is really under attack, and I imagine that Daniel Elberg will, will discuss this at length uh, in, his, uh, in his keynote. Uh, furthermore, we're actually seeing some really interesting developments uh, in countries that you wouldn't normally think of as big opponents of free speech online, uh, like Australia 
and the UK. Uh, just in the last couple of days, uh, we, we have seen some legislation in the UK which uh, has uh, really vastly expanded the uh, surveillance uh, capabilities of, uh, of GCHQ and uh, uh, that's the uh, British equivalent of the NSA. Uh, we've seen some uh, legislative proposals in Australia uh, just earlier this week that would essentially make it uh, illegal to do the kind of reporting that uh, the Washington Post and The Intercept and The Guardian have done on the Snowden leaks if these leaks were about uh, national security issues in Australia. Uh, so if you think that threats to, three, to free speech only exist in you know, authoritarian regimes and that the world is really divided up into the West and the rest, this is simply not true. Um, so I think that's an important point to make. Uh, the other is, uh, you asked a quick question about DDoS. Uh, it is true that uh, one of the ways in which uh, free speech online is under attack, uh, especially in certain countries, especially in uh, the post-Soviet states, is that if uh, somebody uses a platform or a service uh, to speak out against the government in some sort of uh, uh, political way, uh, the, the uh, pro-political forces will turn around and launch a uh, distributed denial of, of service attack against that platform. There have been some really interesting developments in uh, sort of anti-DDoS services recently. Uh, there is a nonprofit organization called Deflect that offers uh, DDoS protection for, uh, for journalists and dissidents and NGOs. Uh, there is also a company called Cloudflare that has uh, started up a service that uh, will, under some circumstances, uh, give their services for free to certain startups, uh, sorry, not to startups, to uh, dissidents and journalists and NGOs. So we're starting to see this sort of stuff made much more available and hopefully this will make uh, sort of uh, speech which is being targeted by DDoS attacks uh, much more robust. In the United States, have there been any uh, important uh, legal decisions in the past couple of years that indicate things are getting more safe or significantly less safe and yeah. um, safer on what first on the first amendment um, you want to say something about the legal, legal? all right uh, so uh, the, the question was whether whether or not things uh, the decisions over the last couple of years and things are getting more or less safe uh, for the first amendment uh, online uh, I think that, that uh, on the whole, um, the First Amendment has been uh, doing well in, in the courts uh, online. There have been uh, probably not too many major First Amendment internet decisions, but this is also because that, uh, that, that has generally worked out well at a lower court uh, level, uh, where uh, it comes up primarily, actually, uh, where the First Amendment is interacting uh, with, well, yeah, IP. There are uh, cases where people are using like the DMCA Copyright uh, Act to take down speech and, and uh, that comes up in the context of fair uses. Um, so probably the, one of the more troubling decisions that we've seen in the last um, year was one, uh, Garcia versus Google, uh, where uh, this ended up where Google had to take down uh, a, a video, The Innocence of Muslims. This was, video was very controversial when it first came out. Uh, one of the actresses involved in that sued Google, saying that uh, she had a copyright in it uh, on account of being in the film. This is a, a non-standard way of looking at copyright. Usually it's the person who makes the film that has the copyright in it, not the people in the film. Uh, but nevertheless, on the basis of that copyright, the, the court ordered uh, Google to remove all uh, traces of that, uh, that film, no links to it, uh, no, take it off of YouTube. Um, and that, that was a little bit disturbing from a free speech perspective, because say what you will about the, the film or whether it was a good or a bad film, uh, it is an interesting controversial issue. Uh, and if people are going to discuss the newsworthiness of the film or whether or not it's a good or a bad film, having a reference uh, point is, is useful. And that is being, uh, uh, so it was the appeals court who did this, but uh, nevertheless, their decision is being appealed to the larger uh, Ninth Circuit Court, and we will, we will see how that decision goes. So there are sort of two other major uh, threats to free speech online 
that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, the first is that in the United States, the sort of uh, the great exception to free speech is uh, is frequently copyrighted material. And uh, one of the interesting things that we've really seen in the last couple of years is a movement to uh, sort of export this view of free speech to other countries in the form of uh, free trade agreements and multilateral trade agreements, uh, such as ACTA, which, was, uh, which we killed uh, last year. But, but just in case you thought that the coast is clear, now we're seeing a lot of the same uh, language come up in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So uh, much like a zombie, this is an idea that, uh, that just keeps getting up and trying to eat our brains. Uh, so one of the things that, we've really, that we're really doing a lot of on the international team is we send people all over the world opposing these free trade agreements and talking about the ways in which normalizing copyright law across countries actually just exports uh, these attacks on free speech and often normalizes a level of protection for free speech which is less than the protection that already exists in the United States and less than the protection that already exists in many other countries. So this is sort of one way that attacks on free speech make it through the sort of IP back door. Uh, the other big threat to free speech that we're really seeing in the last couple of years is that free speech isn't really free on the internet. Most of the time, if you are speaking, you are using somebody else's platform to do so. And you're pretty much at their mercy because it's not about your free speech rights, it's about their free speech rights as the owner of the platform. So if you are using Twitter, you do not have free speech rights on Twitter. Twitter can decide what you are allowed to say based on their terms of service and they may change that at any time. The same is true on Facebook, the same is true on uh, Google Plus for both of you who use that. <laughs> and so one of the things that, that EFF has been working on is, uh, is a site called onlinecensorship.org, which we've just gotten a big uh, grant from the Knight Foundation to work on, where people can report uh, sort of takedowns of, uh, of material on these uh, sort of third party platforms so that we can get some idea of what their policies really are and what they're like and find out whether or not there are kind of biases within these policies. Because frequently these companies are very opaque about what they will and will not take down and under what circumstances because they're really worried about people gaming the system. Um, but this lack of transparency also means that you can have all kinds of hidden bias and people are constantly having stuff taken down and have absolutely no, no idea why that is the case. So this is something that we spend a lot of time working on at EFF and I think it's one of the, the biggest threats to free speech online uh, that uh, actually has uh, nothing to do with the First Amendment at all because it never comes down to a court case. You're really at the mercy of these third party platforms. Um, you mentioned uh, national security letters earlier. Um, mm -hmm. One of the techniques for um, working around that is by saying you have not received a national security letter on your website and um, having that disappear when you when you have. I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, the effectiveness of that, if any. All right, so the question was about uh, warrant canaries, as they're sort of colloquially called, and this is the notion that when you're doing a transparency report, you say zero NSLs, because until you get an NSL, you're not under any obligation to not say about anything about NSLs, because the obligation comes with receiving the NSL. Uh, and then uh, uh, in your next transparency report, because you are not allowed to say that you have received an NSL, you say nothing on the subject, and then maybe people make some inferences based on that absence. Uh, so a number of companies and uh, service providers have put up uh, warrant uh, canaries, um, and has yet to be tested in a, in a court. The basic theory behind it is the notion that compelled speech uh, is one of the things that's very difficult for courts to order. Uh, to say that you must say a lie uh, is also a little bit unusual within our legal tradition to force someone to say, for example, they've gotten zero NSLs when in fact uh, they have uh, received one. Um, it will be an interesting test case and you know, I, I hope that if it comes up, someone will get in touch with us so that we can have that test case. Uh, and hopefully uh, uh, fairly long before uh, it will have to come to uh, uh, either be said or not said, 
uh, because courts, uh, when they're in a rush, are uh, more likely to come to a, a decision that might be uh, unfortunate. Um, so I think there's some good legal arguments why the courts uh, and the government could not compel you to say a lie, uh, but uh, it will have to have a test case to find out and, uh, and bring that forward. Thank you. Um, and I'll elaborate just a tiny bit on that. Uh, two, two of the companies that did this this year that, that posted warrant canaries in a way that we really liked uh, were Tumblr and Pinterest. Both of those companies said that they got zero FISA requests, zero NSLs, um, I think that, that just about, oh, and like zero 215 orders or something like that. Um, they are releasing those reports uh, every six months and on a three or four month delay. Uh, we actually appreciate that um, because if they got one of those sorts of orders, as, as Kurt mentioned, it could be litigated in sort of the cool light of morning, right? It wouldn't be an up all night trying to get a federal judge uh, to, to rule that you're allowed to do something with no notice when the government's on the other side screaming about terrorism and national security. It would be an actual reasoned, you, we would have time to write a good brief, uh, because writing a good brief takes, you, you can do it in, in a single night, and we've we had to do that from time to time, um, but a couple of weeks really helps. Uh, so if you're considering doing a warrant canary at, at your, your own service provider or your, or your startup or your company, um, think about whether you want to do the sort of daily, uh, you know, we didn't get any FISA requests today. We didn't get any FISA requests today. Or if you want to do it every six months. Um, because I, we think that we at least would appreciate the time. Um, if, if we're going to be the ones briefing it, think about giving us six months to do it. Thank you. Um, most everybody here, I expect, understands the importance of freedom, anonymity, privacy. My question is about outreach. When I try to get people interested in EFF, for example, they tell me privacy is dead. The government knows everything about you. Get over it. What do you say to that? Yeah, yeah. And you're hanging out with Scott Neely from uh, Sun Microsystems. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time answering this question. And you would think that this is a sort of a more compelling statement in the United States than, than in other countries, especially given the Snowden revelations. Um, but I, I have talked to activists in Egypt that, uh, you know, before, uh, before the uprising and the revolution and the counter-revolution said, oh, we just do everything in public because the government knows everything all the time anyway. I've talked to people in China who say this, people in Vietnam, uh, places where it is very clear that the government wants everybody to think that they know everything. And what I tell them uh, is, is this, especially if these are people who are, you know, actively opposed to the government. Uh, I tell them, this is what the government wants you to think because it makes you powerless. Uh, when you give in to privacy nihilism and you decide that you're not going to do anything, you've let the government win already. And for people who are, in, yeah. and for people who are inside of the United States, who may lead more comfortable lives and may, you know, genuinely think that they have nothing to hide or don't spend their time, you know, violently de denouncing the government. Uh, there, there are still a couple of reasons why you still have something to hide. There is a reason why you lock your door. There is a reason why you shut your curtains. There is a reason why you don't walk around naked or give me all of your passwords or your, uh, or your, you know, credit card information. You have things to hide. You just haven't really thought about them. And furthermore, even if you have nothing to hide, you have a duty to protect the rights of people who do have something to hide. One of the most interesting things that's really come out of the Snowden revelations, especially in these latest reports from the Washington Post and from The Intercept, um, is that Muslims have been disproportionately targeted by the government simply for being Muslim. Um, I, for example, very rarely hear American Muslims telling me that they have nothing to hide and therefore they should do everything out in the open. So for the people who really need it, you, you need to fight for these people. It's not just enough to cover your own ass. Um, 
I think the truth is, speaking to a room full of hackers, uh, it's up to you guys whether the government has all of the information about every person in the United States, or in fact in many other countries. Uh, if we go out and we build technologies that are structurally secure, uh, especially against dragnet surveillance, where someone can just tap a fiber and get everyone's email, get everyone's browsing history, get everything from a single or a handful of points of collection, then that's the world we are going to live in. Uh, whereas if we go out and we build systems where there aren't those uh, single points that can be tapped so easily, uh, then that's not going to be the world we'll live in. There, there is always going to be a cat and mouse game, a, you know, a fight where your device gets hacked by some ode somewhere uh, if someone targets you and governments are going to use that. But that's a very different uh, uh, game and it's very much more costly uh, for governments to be going around and figuring out how to launch exploits against everyone's devices. Uh, so, and, and there are defenses we can, we can start to put in place when that happens. So uh, I think the answer is, you know, your friend is right only if uh, she gives up, only if the people in this room give up. But if we turn around and we build a secure internet and secure devices, uh, governments won't know everything about us. And one other quick thing uh, to build upon uh, what the gentleman said. Uh, he started off by saying, uh, when I try to do outreach to my friends, and that's, that's music to my ears, that's music to all of our ears, because um, that's what we need. Um, the, the nice thing, one of the nice things of uh, all the news stories of the last year is that um, all of a sudden this thing that we've been clamoring about for the last seven, eight years now, um, if not longer, uh, is part of the conversation. It's part of everyday conversation. And that only happens when um, you guys make it part of the conversation, when you actually uh, talk about this with other people, when you actually share these uh, um, stories and our blog posts and actually take action. Uh, so, please, uh, you know, thank you for doing this sort of outreach. You may run into these obstacles and, uh, and walls, but uh, I encourage all of you to, to follow what he's doing. All right. Uh, first question is actually for the audience. Uh, how many of you have actually had to call the EFF about something? You know, whether it's just asking a, a question or anything? Just... No, not as many as I thought. Curious. Yeah. Uh, I've had to phone you guys a couple of times on things. Uh, <laughs> Happens. Just mostly questions because uh, I'm from Canada, and so coming down here with interpretation of laws. Uh, if any of you find me outside of a, one of the talks, uh, I owe you drinks. So, uh, second thing. Uh, you had mentioned uh, you do a lot of work internationally. I'm curious what sort of uh, uh, efforts you've got going in Canada, just out of curiosity as a Canadian. Well, uh, the majority of my work in Canada is done in conjunction with Citizen Lab, which is a uh, academic institution affiliated with the University of, uh, of Toronto and the Monk School of, uh, of International, I think it's just the Monk International School. Um, Anyway, so a lot of what we do is uh, I work with a group called ASL-19, which is made up largely of, uh, of sort of uh, Iranian expats. We do some work on, on Iran based out of Canada. Uh, we have also done some work on uh, Canadian uh, surveillance uh, in conjunction with, uh, with Citizen Lab. We have done uh, work on uh, Canadian IP law. Now, this is an area thoroughly staked out by Michael Geist, um, who is, is practically synonymous with, with Canadian IP law, but we've done a lot of, a lot of work uh, with him and, uh, and with CIPIC. So, uh, yes, we are, we are very concerned about Canada. Canada, not just America's hat. And uh, <laughs> A well, place where, in fact, the laws are different and you still, you know, need to de defend human rights. And, and a few of our colleagues were actually just up there a few weeks ago because um, uh, there was a TPP meeting up there. And um, as Eva mentioned earlier, this is one of those trade agreements that is we're trying to launder off all these bad laws, especially around copyright. Uh, and one of these big uh, uh, meetings that happened behind closed doors with no uh, civil society input at all was happening up there. So uh, we actually had a very... Um, uh, awesome uh, campaign up there where uh, signs and flyers and, and, and protests and everything, and it was great. Uh, just for reference, I prefer to think of Canada as the left department over a really loud party. So. <laughs> uh, last questions for the audience. If there's an open seat next to you, I'm getting booted from mine, so if you could just put your hand up so I can go somewhere else. All right, there's one back there. Thank you. Hi, um, I wasn't going to come up and ask this question, but since you just talked about the critical importance of pseudonymity and anonymity, 
to the work of the EFF and to other advocacy groups like you, and you were bonus, you're just talking about like, let's go to the closed meeting and like put signs up and fight it. Yeah. So there's an open process that's been going since 2011 mm -hmm. in the United States called the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. I like to say it's almost as bad as it sounds, except it's completely open. There's like, now we have like maybe 100 folks showing up. And I'm one of the citizen advocates that's been active the whole time. And advocacy groups like yours and others are choosing not to participate. And the strategy explicitly calls out the need to maintain pseudonymity and anonymity online. And my concern is without active engagement from citizens and from knowledgeable folks like you, that we will lose these rights because they will make verified identity online a requirement and it will become so easy that we won't have free speech online. So I'm confused by the stance of your organization and several others to not engage in open processes around these issues that are to build the future infrastructure and the future policy to maintain pseudonymity and anonymity online. So I'd like to understand how you're choosing what you're engaging with and why you're choosing not to be involved in open processes that are shaping the future and being pulled together in these multi-stakeholder ways. So uh, to answer that, we actually have had some involvement in, uh, in NISTIC. So NISTIC is this, uh, this initiative uh, by the federal government to try and build uh, some set of standards for how uh, when you talk to the government, uh, some government agency, whether it's maybe the IRS or the, uh, the Veterans Affairs Department or some other department, uh, there's a method that they can authenticate you online. Uh, and as you can imagine, this kind of conversation between government and industry about how it's going to do effectively the online version of ID cards or multiple different types of ID cards turns into an incredibly complicated, um, perhaps like, you know, sometimes uh, pathologically complicated. It's the kind of process that might not produce a result. Um, process or you know, and debate around you know how how governments are going to rely on uh, private identity providers. And uh, so, you know, EFF has actually participated in uh, proposals into that pro process for anonymized and pseudonymized identity systems. Uh, there, there's, there are grants being given out by the government to try and support that, and so we work with academics who want those grants to say, hey, why don't you build, you know, as part of the response to this call for designs, let's build the real privacy-preserving anonymity system, uh, a, 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 a optional identity system where you can say, yeah, identify me or don't, depending on, on what you'd prefer. Um, and of course, those things haven't actually been, been picked in that process. But as an organization, uh, EFF has to be strategic about large, complicated, bureaucratic processes that we do or don't participate in. Because if you look around the world at potential processes like that, that could affect the internet in, in bad ways. You know, I could probably give you literally dozens of them inside multiple standards organizations in the internet standard space, in government activities, etc. And so if you look at EFF's staff headcount and divided that uh, between all of those processes, we could be, you know, going and arguing about the way the domain name is, uh, system is architectured, architected. We could, could be arguing about um, the next generation of standards at the W3C, et cetera, and we do some of those. We just don't have the head count to staff every one of those processes. So what we do is more strategic. We look at one, we put in a, you know, a filing or, or um, a, you know, a comment at the right moment, and then if a big process like that at the end looks like it's producing an outcome that's actually going to be really dangerous to your rights on the internet, that's when we'll spin up and engage fully uh, and try and make sure that we can deflect the damage. But we, we, you know, we have to be strategic but one, about that. I, I'm, I'm also confused about why not proactively participate so that it is good? And that's, that's just a challenge I put out there. Well, that's actually what we've done. You know, we, filed the, we filed the proposal for the but way we wanted never, that to happen. I don't, anyways, and then, I'm just naming an issue that I think is a challenge for all of these groups. But I think proactive participation in open process is a good thing. Anyways, Aesthetics and I are presenting about this at 11 tonight. If any of you are interested in learning more about what's happened there. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, I was um, wondering if you could talk about some of the difficulties in arguing the technical aspects of these cases in front of judges that seem to have no idea about these technologies. I mean, some of these judges don't even know how to check their own email, let alone um, understand the issues that you're arguing. So um, what types of strategies do you use in explaining um, the, the technology and the t more technical aspects of these cases? So one of the great things about EFF is that we have both lawyers and technologists on staff. Um, I had a case last year um, where we were defending uh, a number of uh, anonymous and pseudonymous bloggers um, who were, uh, they, they were not parties to a lawsuit, but uh, Chevron had subpoenaed their names and IP logs over the course of nine years to do some pretty invasive tracking of these people um, in order to, to chill their speech. And so I had to describe to a federal judge what nine years of IP logs actually meant. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great because we have technologists like Peter uh, and a, a big staff now, I think we have, what, six technologists on staff who help us write those briefs. Um, and so in, in that particular brief, uh, our senior staff technologist, Seth Schoen, um, helped us write um, a really cogent description um, of, of what nine years of IP logs actually meant. Um, so. It, it, yeah, it's hard, um, but we have both lawyers who know a little bit about tech and technologists who know a little bit about law sit down and write the thing together. Um, and it's collaborative and it's sometimes fun. Um, and Seth and Peter and, and, and Jan and the rest of the technologists will sit down with the lawyers and you know, teach us what a fiber optic splitter in DPI means for the NSA uh, and you know what the, in, in what a browser fingerprint looks like in the in the panopticlick, um, and and we're able to hopefully teach federal judges. Um, I was going to say, do you feel the judges actually understand, or do you feel like it's a crapshoot every time on whether or not they're understanding what you're you know you're yeah, arguing? It, it is rolling the dice, but then we look at decisions like uh, this year out of the Supreme Court it was a case called Riley versus California, and this is the case where the Supreme Court says law enforcement needs a warrant to search your smartphone pursuant mm -hmm. to an arrest. The court got it, mm -hmm. um, and what the, the, the court cited uh, our amicus brief a couple of times actually in describing exactly how invasive uh, a smartphone search is. So yeah, we have had some some noted success in the, explaining to courts what it means, what the technology means. Sometimes they don't get it, but mm -hmm. we, we have had, especially this year, the courts are starting to get it. You know, Judge Sotomayor um, knows what 30 days worth of GPS tracking is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing my question, I thought he was in line. Okay, um, so I was most recently in Ecuador where there is sort of a growing free internet freedom community that is linking up with other UNASUR countries, like Argentina, Brazil is pretty exciting right now, and Chile. And so I just wanted to find out sort of what is going on with you guys connecting to UNASUR, because it's sort of a, not just within social, civil society, but within government, there is an increasing interest for drafting alternative laws that protect privacy and protect um, freedom on the internet in those countries. So I thought I'd ask. <laughs> anyway, All right. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, your, your question was, uh, was, well, I suppose not specifically about Ecuador, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Katitza Rodriguez, is currently on a Latin American tour. She <laughs> is uh, originally from Peru. Uh, speaks fluent Spanish and uh, is incredibly well connected throughout the the Latin American sort of uh, netizen uh, sphere and so she is traveling throughout Latin America right now talking to grassroots groups uh, all over specifically about this issue she's talking to them about surveillance and she's talking to them about you know drafting uh, sort of alternative legislation. She was also very much involved in uh, the drafting of the 13 principles of the application of human rights law to mass surveillance, which is a document which was written and, uh, and signed by hundreds of NGOs all over the world. 
and which we're sort of uh, holding up as our answer to, so what should surveillance law look like uh, in countries in both U.S. and outside of the U.S.? And she's been very influential in uh, the latest U.N. report, uh, which essentially said, we don't think that mass surveillance is, uh, is really consistent with human rights law and, uh, and your right to free speech and privacy. So uh, yeah, we've made a, a lot of progress in this area and I hope that we will make more as Katitsa's uh, Latin American tour continues. <laughs> All right, we were just told that was the last question, so thank you very much for coming here. <laughs> We'll, we'll be around the rest of the weekend, so come swing by our booth uh, downstairs. Yep. Thank you, guys. Um, we had a request right. for yes. you to go and visit the press area. Okay.
mic is turned on. Hello. Hello? <laughs> uh, great. Um, so I have a, sorry about the technical difficulties, which are now resolved. Uh, thank you for your patience. I have a, an announcement that if anyone from the press is here and wants to interview the EFF panelists who just spoke, um, this fellow here will escort you to the press room. And so, yeah, you can just meet him over here. Great. Um, and now we're actually just going to start our presentation, uh, Secure Drop, a WikiLeaks in every newsroom. Woo! Thanks, guys. Uh, awesome to see so many people here. Uh, so, yeah, this is Secure Drop, a WikiLeaks in every newsroom. My name is Garrett, and I'm a security and privacy engineer at Mozilla, and I also work on Secure Drop. Um, this is Bill. Hi there, I'm uh, Bill Buddington. Uh, I work as a developer at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We also have our uh, fingerprints up here. Hi, I'm Jan, and I work as a technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So we all have day jobs. We work on a secure drop for Freedom of the Press um, as well. And uh, quickly, Freedom of the Press Foundation is a nonprofit that was founded in December 2012. It was originally created as a fancy way to launder money for WikiLeaks, but since then it's kind of expanded its scope. Um, so now we fund and support a lot of really cool projects, exposing, um, focusing mostly on public interest journalism, and we have a really cool board that has uh, some awesome people like Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, John Cusack, who's a huge supporter of Press Freedom, awesome, uh, and Ellsberg and Snowden, who we'll be hearing from after our talk. Um, woo! So yeah, we uh, continue to process payments for WikiLeaks. Uh, if you want to donate to them and don't like how it's being blocked off, you can go to our website and donate uh, to support them. Uh, we also do fundraisers, um, crowdfunding campaigns for encryption tools. Um, we crowdfunded transcripts for Chelsea Manning's trial, which was, would not have been made public otherwise. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and we also operate and maintain SecureDrop, um, which is a whistleblowing system that any news organization can install and use to receive anonymous tips and communicate with sources safely. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. So the question is, why SecureDrop? Anyone recognize this face? A few of you, right? Yeah, he's been wandering the crowd, and he gave a talk uh, yesterday, and this is Thomas Drake. Uh, he leaked information about fraud and abuse of the NSA, part of the Trailblazer program in 2005. Uh, he was indicted under the Espionage Act under Obama. Uh, this is kind of unusual because the Espionage Act is a federal law uh, that was you know, enacted in 1917. It was meant to criminalize spies and not journalists, uh, and Thomas Drake was exposing corruption you know, and he went through every conceivable channel to expose uh, corruption internally before, in, before going uh, out to the public. It's also unusual given that this is the most transparent administration in history. <laughs> Believe it! <laughs> well, put that aside for a moment. Uh, the Espionage Act has been used for decades to criminalize uh, those leaking documents. Daniel Ellsberg, also probably in the crowd, uh, has <laughs> been... Um, Indicted was indicted in 1971 uh, for uh, releasing the Pentagon Papers. Uh, in 1985, Samuel Morrison under Reagan. In 2006, uh, Lawrence Franklin under Bush. So you can see this history of the executive branch criminalizing leaks under the Espionage Act. Uh, the only thing is, uh, this is an unusual move for a president voted in on the premise of change. Uh, but one crackdown on leaks, however, totally illegitimate, shouldn't besmirch an entire administration's history and legacy, right? Um, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then this happened. Shemai Leibovitz convicted uh, for leaking uh, FBI wiretaps in May 2010. And then this happened. Stephen Kim uh, indicted in August 2010 for giving uh, classified information to Fox News about North Korea. Uh, that's kind of not cool, guys. Maybe you should tone it down. And this happened. Uh, Chelsea Manning uh, convicted of 35 years uh, in military prison. So, of course, uh, we have a few more names to add to the list. Jeffrey Sterling, John Caracow, and Edward Snowden. Uh, 
all indicted, um, some charged uh, with Espionage Act under Obama. So we have this kind of paradigm that in the 20th century, a journalist could protect their sources just by refusing to disclose them. In the 21st century, the journalists are out of the loop completely. They're taken out of the equation, and the government can discover sources on their own. So let's go over a bit of threat modeling. Uh, these mass surveillance programs can even compromise the source before they get to the point of submission. Uh, they might not even be able to submit documents to the press in the first place before they're caught. Um, and even when they do actually get there, uh, we've learned through a Google study in March 2014 that 21 out of 25 media organizations across the world uh, have been uh, the target of a state-sponsored hacker attack. So that's kind of frightening. Uh, two days ago, Edward Snowden has this quote. Journalists have to be particularly conscious about any sort of network signaling, any sort of connection, any sort of license plate reading device that they pass on their way to a meeting point, any place they use their credit card, any place they take their phone, any email contact they have with their source, because that very first contact before encrypted communications are established is enough to give it all away. This has been called a high-tech war on leaks by the New York Times. You know, as I said, in total, eight leakers have been charged under the Espionage Act under Obama alone. And for some bully collaborating with a source, James Rosen had his phone calls and emails tapped without his knowledge. So what options do leakers have? You have a trove of documents. You want to get them out to the public. Um, it's of vital importance. Uh, how do you do it? If you don't have the technical skills to actually do uh, what uh, Edward Snowden was able to do. You can try to email a reporter, but you know half the time they have a stat page and they don't actually publish any GPG keys. How do you do that? How do you send them files securely? Um, even if you do have the skills to send them files securely, uh, they might not have a GPG key for you to do so. Uh, even if they do, how do you protect your own anonymity? Uh, do you create an anonymous email address? How and with what service? Uh, if you were a whistleblower today, uh, would you send a snail mail to open up communication? I mean, that doesn't leave a digital trace, but it leaves a bio trace. It leaves bio data. And as they say, mo snail mail, mo problems. Um, I don't know if they actually say that, but <laughs> <laughs> it leaves traces. Um, so there are a lot of unanswered questions for a potential leaker. So you're kind of left with this situation. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jan. Thank you, Bill. That was great. So yeah, so we were, we were in this situation um, a few months ago, and we thought, well, what? Well, not that we were leakers, but we, were, we saw that other people were in this situation. And we thought, well, how do we fix it? Uh, and our solution was SecureDrop. So SecureDrop uh, has a server in each newsroom like physically located in each newsroom where uh, the sources can send documents. And the server runs a Tor Hidden Service. Uh, Y'all know about Tor Hidden Services. Sort of. Okay. Uh, so Tor Hidden Services can only be accessed via Tor, and that provides uh, some guarantee of anonymity for the source. Um, there's a web front end on the Tor Hidden Service to upload documents using the Tor Browser Bundle. Uh, and the nice thing about the Tor Browser Bundle is that not only whistleblowers have it. It's not a specialized piece of software, so that's some plausible deniability for the source. And each document gets PGP encrypted to the journalist for a confidentiality. Uh, Garrett will talk more about how and where that encryption happens, because I'm sure a lot of you are wondering whether it happens on the client side or the server side. Uh, we'll get to that later. So, uh, so SecureDrop is essentially a Dropbox hosted directly in the newsroom. Um, and why would we do that? Well, so Congress in 1980 established the Privacy Protection Act to protect newsrooms from arbitrary seizures. Uh, in addition, because there's no third party involved in this source to journalist to source communication, um, that's some extra legal protection. So there's no third party email service like LavaBit to subpoena in this case. So great, uh, we're, we're, we're doing awesome, right? Secure drop, we're, we're happy. Uh, but um, so, you, so here's a quick history of how this came to be. Um, so it was originally created as Dead Drop by Aaron Schwartz and Kevin Polson in 2012. And the New Yorker just deployed it in May 2013. Their instance is still running. 
Um, Freedom of the Press Foundation took over in October of last year, and we renamed it to Secure Drop. Here's a lovely picture of Aaron and Kevin working on Secure Drop. Um, and so far, here are the numbers. We've had three security audits. Uh, we have around 50 contributors, so it's a very active open source project. Two major releases so far, and 0.3 is coming out very shortly. 12 running instances that we know of, including Forbes, Guardian, Washington Post, um, and ProPublica. And only, only one leak accidentally submitted to our GitHub page as an issue, as a GitHub issue. And after that, I put up a big warning that said, do not submit leaks to our GitHub repository. It's not a secure drop instance, even though it has the logo on the front page. Uh, so quickly, how does secure drop work? Great. Uh, so as we said, we have a, sorry, this text is kind of small, but we have a Tor hidden service, uh, uh, which provides source anonymity. So we have a public, uh, so Tor hidden services are dot .onion addresses, and the Tor browser bundle can route dot .onion addresses to the correct Tor hidden service. So uh, the public dot .onion is published on the news sources website and in many public places, um, and on our secure drop directory, uh, PGP signed. Um, and this is where the source goes to submit documents. So they open up Tor browser bundle, they go to some base64 string dot .onion, and they, go, uh, and they see this, uh, submit documents for the first time, or uh, check for responses to uh, things that you've already submitted. And if you submit documents for the first time, we uh, generate a long random authorization uh, code name for you. Um, we can talk about that more later, but we have a really cool authorization system that makes things both memorable and pretty secure. Um, and the same server running this public .onion also runs a secret .onion Tor hidden service. Uh, and this is a, what's called a stealth authenticated Tor hidden service, which means you don't know about it unless you have the secret token. And so this is only accessed by the journalists. So they log in to the secret .onion and they can retrieve source documents and write replies to the sources. Uh, this is what it looks like for them. We're doing some UI work right now. You can see there's messages, you can uh, mark them, read them. Um, but, uh, but by the time they get to this point, they're GPG encrypted. So uh, the journalist has to take them off uh, that uh, on a USB stick and move them to an air gap machine. Uh, so only the air gap machine has the secret key to decrypt these documents. Um, quickly go over this. Uh, Great. And so uh, the point of having the air gap machine is so that we don't have to take the secret key off an air gap ever. And um, once they get to the air gap machine, they can decrypt, decrypt documents, they can square metadata, they can decide what they want to publish and move just the parts that they want to publish to a different USB stick and take it off and move it to their personal computer and start publishing. Um, and the additional server is a monitoring server which has uh, this OSEC alert system to see if the app server hosting the, these .onion things are, um, are still active. And if not, if they send out these SMTP alerts. Uh, Here's a diagram. Um, we can talk more about it if you have questions, but uh, Garrett's going to talk about some of our future plans for Secure Drop now. Hey guys, so that was a whirlwind tour of the Secure Drop architecture. Um, show of hands if you understood it. Oh, wow. wow you. you are all lying. <laughs> Thanks for being so nice. That was great. Um, I'm really glad. So uh, if you did understand the architecture, or at least you have some sense of the parts of it, you might be thinking, oh, wait, I got ahead of myself. Quickly, SecureDrop 0.3, uh, that's the new release that we're releasing in about two weeks. Um, we have a few more final issues to fix up, but here's a sneak peek of what to expect. Um, this is what the source UI looks like in the current version. Um, if you were polite, you might say it's a little homely. Um, and we're upgrading that so it looks kind of like sexy and fresh um, in the new version. And hopefully it's also more friendly um, and easier to use and understand. Um, we also did the same thing with the journalist interface. And not only does it look nicer, but we also incorporated a lot of usability improvements that were specifically requested by our deployment partners. So I get a lot of emails that our journalists saying like, hey man, this is really annoying, this is happening, or this is hard to use. And so we took all those filed issues on GitHub and then resolved them one by one. So this is an incremental improvement that has a lot of requested features and should make it easier for journalists to kind of develop a workflow around SecureDrop. Um, 
In version 0.2, installation is somewhat complicated. As you can see, there are multiple components. Um, there's a lot of security hardening, which uh, takes a pretty experienced sysadmin to set up properly. Um, we actually have such an awesome person on our team. Um, so in version 0.2, we have a full-time employee who travels around to every news organization, sets up SecureDrop, trains their employees, and helps them with updates and any problems they might have. Uh, in 0 0.3, we replace him with uh, an apps get. Um, <laughs> thanks. So he'll still be around helping us out, but we don't need to like waste his time on doing the same job every time, which is going to be awesome. Um, so yeah, we also got an audit done, this time by iSec Partners. They did a really great audit of our code, uh, found some issues, nothing too major. So we're going to release the full audit report along with the code in about two weeks once we have everything, all the issues from the audit fixed up. Uh, this is part of our commitment to audit every single release that we put out. Um, because we recognize that people use this for high security situations, and we want to make sure the software is as safe as possible. So we'll have every release uh, from now on audited by independent third parties, and we got ISEC to do a, this one. They did a great job. So rock and roll. Thanks. So back when I was saying, uh, if you understood the architecture, you might have had, uh, if you're familiar with security engineering at all, a few thoughts like this. Um, it's not a perfect architecture. There are a lot of trade-offs for usability, and I want to talk a little bit about what those look like. Um, so one thing that you can say about SecureDrop is that it's a web application. Um, that's good because it makes it easy to use. The process is pretty much install the Tor browser bundle, visit a .onion address for that news organization, and then click a bunch of buttons. It's way easier to set up than GPG or OTR. And it also has, as Jan mentioned before, a nice property of plausible deniability. Since the Tor browser does a lot of work to try and erase any traces of sessions that you, you, that you uh, do in the Tor browser, um, by simply not storing any persistent state in the application, it's pretty easy to uh, have a strong assurance about the application not leaving traces on a source's machine. So if a source is being investigated, they might have the Tor browser bundle, um, but they don't have like a secure drop native client, which would look a little bit more awkward. Um, and so we think that's a pretty cool property. Uh, unfortunately, secure drop is also a web application. Um, and it means that there is the huge attack surface of the browser to contend with. Uh, we do encourage sources to disable JavaScript, and that's specifically with the Tor Freedom hosting attacks in mind of last August, where the FBI used targeted malware based on a JavaScript exploit to own a bunch of Tor users and de-anonymize them. So that is a, kind of a cool mitigation, but we have no idea if people actually follow our instructions. Um, and it also really limits the, what we can do with the application. If you're a web developer, uh, try writing a thing without JavaScript these days. It's pretty hard to do. Um, so it also limits use cases. You know, if you're a source who doesn't feel comfortable using a browser for whatever reason, um, we simply have a really difficult time supporting uh, your threat model and your use case, because everything is so constrained to this one stack. Um, Another design choice, which is kind of questionable, is that we do server-side encryption. So plain text is sent from a source to the server over the Tor hidden service protocol, which is encrypted end-to-end, -end, um, and then it's encrypted on behalf of the source on the server. Uh, this is great for usability. There are no keys to manage. It also helps maintain deniability. Imagine if you're an engineer for a second trying to do end-to-end -end encryption without storing any state. Uh, it's tricky. Not impossible, but tricky. Um, it also lets us use established tools like GPG. So instead of rolling around crypto, we can simply use uh, established, audited, um, highly considered tools that already exist. And that makes auditing and uh, reasoning about the security of the system a lot easier. Um, but uh, it makes the server a huge, huge target. Um, and this is some of the things that an attacker can do if they have an active, ongoing attack on a secure drop server right now. They can get the plain text of all submissions submitted past the point of compromise. Uh, plain text of submissions reveals what's being submitted, and it might, it might reveal who is submitting it, depending on the metadata that could be stored in that file. Um, we treat that as being almost as severe as a Tor compromise, aka a full de-anonymization. Um, so it's a really, really severe attack. Um, they can also get the source's passphrase when it's been sent to the server. Um, they can pull it in as it's being fed to the server over the Tor hidden service protocol. And then they can use that to decrypt replies that are sent from the journalist to the source. As you might imagine, those could contain all kinds of correlating data that would help you identify a source. 
Um, of course, they can get all of the stored encrypted submissions and replies. They are encrypted and the keys are kept offline in cold storage, as Jan said before, but they still can't access that and maybe then get those keys. Um, and they can also get the metadata about the size and timing of communication, which could also be useful for an investigation. So this is pretty bad. It means we have to be really, really careful about the server and make sure that it's not being compromised, which is why, as Jan said before, we have an OSSEC-based monitoring server and all this, uh, all this hardening steps built into the server to try and mitigate this risk, but it's still a huge risk. Um, also, if you're a network attacker and you can do an active man in the middle of, say, the Tor Hidden Service Protocol, then you can read plain text submissions and replies, um, depending on your perspective and uh, what traffic you can eavesdrop on. So the Tor Hidden Service Protocol is, as far as we know, secure, um, and it is end-to-end, -end, but we'd like to have more defense in depth and not rely on that protocol alone to be secure. And of course, you can DOS things, but anyone, that, that's not, people can always do that. Um, yeah, so these are the solutions we're considering for uh, kind of a big overhaul and a re-architecture of SecureDrop, uh, tentatively called the 1.0 release. So we'll have a generic API um, that allows us to make implementation agnostic clients. So it could be a web app and we can maintain the experience that we have now, or it could be a native application and we can use that platform to develop a much more hardened um, application with better security assurances, um, et cetera. The possibilities become limitless. Um, and then through that, we can hopefully support more use cases and threat models um, and support a wider array of sources. You know, like if you're a, like a local whistleblower, maybe you don't have the same adversary as Edward Snowden does. We'd like to kind of uh, support a wide range um, with appropriate tools for everybody in between. Um, and we also want to encrypt end to end, and that will, of course, minimize the damage from the server compromise I was just talking about. So uh, from this list, if we have end to end encryption, uh, my animation is gone, um, but the first two things are no longer a problem. Um, and the fourth thing is still a problem, but we can obfuscate and normalize, which we already do some of today. Um, we can try and make that less of a problem than it is. Um, and then on this slide, the first point about uh, reading plain text submissions and replies is no longer a problem if the communication is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, so yeah, some of the challenges we're facing are trying to maintain plausible deniability as we move to an end-to-end -end system. As I said before, that's a challenge. It's very difficult to do, but not impossible. Um, and more generally, as you want to create more full-featured applications, storing state uh, is very useful, um, and we want to trade off the deniability with the functionality of the application. So that's pretty tricky. Um, and usability is a challenge, especially for journalists. You know, we have an air gap that we currently enforce every installation to transfer submissions to an air gap to work with them, which is really nice from a security point of view, but it's also a huge pain in the ass. Um, so it's not clear if that's always the best thing to do. We'd like to support, again, a wider variety of use cases to make this a useful tool for journalists and for sources. Um, that's kind of just a, a, a subset of what we're working on, but I wanted to kind of whet your appetite. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, check out our Twitter account. We have a mailing list for developers. Our GitHub is very active. And of course, uh, SecureDrop and everything that the Freedom of the Press Foundation does is supported by donations. So please consider donating. And I went through that really fast because we have to end really early, but I think we still have 15 minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, please come to the mic. Uh, yeah, can you go to the mic, please? So people can hear it? Oh, no, go for it. What's up? So the question was, what, if any, protection do we have against screen scrapers on whistleblower computers? Uh, none. No protection against that. We, uh, part of our threat model is that we assume the source machine has not been compromised by malware, and that would fall under the category of malware currently. So it seems to me that one of the possible weak points here is getting um, the leaker to actually download the Tor browser bundle, particularly in light of some of the revelations that anyone who downloads Tor is, could be a uh, target of surveillance. So it seems like, um, you know, if Alice works for the CIA and wants to leak documents, as soon as she does a Google search for Tor browser bundle, that could be a weak point in the communication. So it definitely uh, raises some flags, I think, in the X key score programs that we've seen if you're downloading to our browser bundle, uh, and that's a real issue. But I think that um, when you're downloading to our browser bundle, there's uh, an array of use cases for it, and it's not just whistleblowers, it's all sorts of people. Um, they, you know, even the national security industry uses 
uh, tour to uh, protect their own bodies uh, when they're working in countries uh, that are outside the US. So it doesn't automatically open you up for a, a full-scale investigation, I would say, but it certainly would raise some flags. Uh, and we've been thinking about the process of traffic analysis and tour and how to mitigate um, the ways by which a source could be compromised in that way. Everyone here should download the Tor browser bundle right now and yeah. Google it. Yeah. And so let's give people some more plausible deniability, right? <laughs> if you guys could like repeatedly download it uh, randomly every day, that'd be really great. Yeah, write a cron job to download it every yeah. day.